I'm John Furrier at SiliconAngle.com and SiliconAngle.tv here at IDF Intel Developer Forums in the Developer Zone, software.intel.com. I'm at Omar Trainman with Cloudera, a new era in computing, play on a new cloud era, the new data center era. Omar, you uh, have been on the Cube before. Welcome back to our mobile Cube. Thank you. Thank you very much. So tell us, uh, obviously, Cloudera, you guys are, are, are a, a new growing company in here with the old growing Intel, and their keynote today was really about a modern era. It was talking about uh, mobile, obviously, and the fourth generation processors. Um, you guys are really have taken advantage of the whole Intel commodity hardware, industry standard hardware, whatever you want to call it. You know, the massive scale out, open source has been a real force right now. Um, so, what is the scene here for you guys? Why are you here at Intel? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's actually two reasons that we see a lot of this changing how uh, data centers are managed. There's uh, the reason for the change, which is coming from mobile, which is coming from the explosion of processors. That means more machine generated, generated data. It means more log files. It means more events. It means more types and varieties of data. And those are creating pressures on the classic model that you have in the data center where you buy real big iron that's special purpose that can only do one aspect of, in this case, data management, data processing, data analytics. And so the change we're seeing that happen, uh, uh, that effect have on the back end, is that within the data center, people want to standardize. They want industry standard hardware, industry standard components. You still get the variations. You get spinning disk, which is going to be around at least for a little while longer. Of course, you get flash, which is going to take over as the next generation. Uh, there's now uh, 10 gig and eventually 40, 100 gig networking, but 10 gig now starting to standardize. Larger volumes of memory and uh, you know, typically Intel processors. And then those actually change depending on the application that you're deploying it for. Even within uh, Hadoop, even within uh, big data management, there are different types of storage heavy or compute heavy applications. And so now uh, from an IT perspective, instead of buying big iron that's specially designed for one thing, you get industry standard hardware. You still have to kind of design it and tune it for the different applications. One of the trends we've been seeing here at Intel is Intel moving from being a component player to actually being an actual data center player. We had Pauline Nist on. You guys have taken advantage of that trend by being a major player in the data center. Can you share with your experiences what you've seen in the data center and or the cloud, private, public, or hybrid, where there's been kind of architectural change? I mean, we've been talking about IO-centric infrastructure on theCUBE with you and Omar, I mean, uh, Amr and uh, Mike as well. What changes are you seeing specifically around architectures, SANS, and the impact of, say, flash and solid state? Absolutely, um, and I think flash and solid state are pushing it forward. Um, disk is still in there to some extent, but the really the move is away from separating, which has been, been uh, the classic way of doing things, separating storage and compute towards using these standardized components to bring them together. Right, so Intel, of course, sells CPUs, they sell networking gear, but it's also a lot of the I.O. channels that are now built into the servers. You just put the storage in the server, you put intelligent software on the servers, and you also need a lot less of separate storage. Right, The storage and compute come together. And there's a, lot, there's a variety of different use cases, so it's not all one size fits all, but it's a general philosophy. Um, and so with that, we were excited to be at the first Hadoop world ever um, a couple years ago, and at that time, Abhi Meadow was at Bank of America, he's now got his own, his own startup. He, he coined the term data factories, mm -hmm. and um, that was interesting at the time, and we all said, that's absolutely home run, we love it. But can you talk about what's, how that's evolved today, because we're kind of seeing that happen. Specifically, talk to the audience around how you're seeing people organizing their data. I think data factories is uh, very prescient about how things are evolving. Today we hear data hub or data reservoir, but it's the exact same concept. Instead of data flowing freely throughout the enterprise, landing on file servers, getting shuffled over to compute servers, and then ending up through an ETL grid in a database, it's getting centralized on joint storage and compute architectures. And so by putting data in the same place that you actually compute on that storage, maybe bringing different engines to this scale out industry standard compute and storage architecture together, that's the, uh, that's the evolution that we're seeing. And that becomes your data hub, it becomes your data factory, it becomes your data reservoir where you have pristine data. So in the storage business, there's been a lot of talk about tiering and thin provisioning, which has been around, and we've seen some great companies uh, get started and get sold and do some great things around that. How has the storage business changed? Because you guys play in this area heavily with the big data and, and in a variety of different capacities. Data is closer to the server, you pull it in, push this, you push the processors to the data, vice versa, all kinds of different approaches. What have you seen around the storage industry specifically that's changing? And, and what's being hyped up right now? We're seeing a ton of companies saying they got some Hadoop here, a little connector here, 
What's your take on that? I think IT now gets to make a decision. Do they want to store data for the purpose of storing it, or do they want to store data for the purpose of using it? And if they're going to store data for the purpose of using it, they're typically using something like Hadoop. They're using a big data platform in order to run it. And then they want to connect it with the rest of their data management infrastructure. When you install something like Hadoop on industry standard hardware, nothing happens. It doesn't, it doesn't materialize anything. It's like a spam filter or an email gateway. You actually have to connect it to the various data sources that are driving data in, as well as what's consuming data on the back end. So all that connectivity is critical, and that lets IT decide, do we want to move data through this pipeline where they're actually using data and using it to drive the business, or do we want to offline it and put it on tiered storage where it's not really accessed or used anymore? So I was showing you our little tool where we're measuring some of the, some of the crowds, IT professionals and data scientists. We're seeing some interest in Hadoop. We're seeing some interest in MongoDB, Aussie Analytics. Can you share with the folks where Hadoop and Mongo differ? We're seeing, you know, some people like Mongo over here better. There's obviously different NoSQL databases out there. What is Hadoop? How does Hadoop differ from the different uh, products? Yeah, I think uh, Hadoop's philosophy is that there isn't any single engine that's going to solve all problems, but all the engines in a world where every piece of data is big and needs to be touched by a lot of engines should live on some kind of unified storage and compute fabric. So I think Mongo is very useful. It's an important specialized engine and it solves a lot of interesting problems. Uh, primarily, I think we've seen kind of the document and application serving space. But when you talk about these deep data pipelines, advanced analytics, when you move into big data and real-time analytics, you actually need to stitch all that together on one fabric and apply different kinds of engines on top of that. So can you give a specific example where Mongo's different from say Hadoop and, and what's this thing Storm people have been talking about Storm? Uh, in order. <laughs> um, so I think if you look at Mongo, where we see people using it is typically on the front end serving an application. Uh, whereas if you're generating a lot of data, you need to compute that data and feed it back into your application. That part of it would actually happen on a Hadoop system where you're keeping your historical data forever. Uh, Storm is being used a lot more on the real time side. Uh, what used to be called complex event processing, where you're actually pushing data but not storing it. Um, and you're doing uh, compute on the wire as data flows. And again, it's sort of a, a separate area within big data, uh, but most of the data that we see today is in this large data reservoir. All right, give us an update now on the Cloudera front. Obviously, how many employees you guys have and that kind of thing. Quickly, don't go too, too <laughs> deep on that. I don't want to waste too much time on it because you guys are growing. Just get the numbers out there. And to talk about what's going on in the Apache open source area and what's the exciting things coming on the, down the pike, if you can share a little bit about what's coming at Strata at Dupe World. Yeah, uh, so we are growing fast. I think we're uh, close to around 300 employees at this point, which is for a four-year-old company, that's pretty wild growth. Um, a lot of that investment and actually to your point has been on the open source side. Uh, over a third of the company is just focused on building great software that is open source that people can use. Uh, so we spend a lot of our time contributing to the Apache community. We do all of our uh, development on the platform out at Apache and then we actually use Apache projects to build CDH. So you get 100% Apache open source artifact but you get it reliably on a quarterly basis with minor versions every quarter with major versions every year. Um, the really cool feature that uh, we've seen coming out. So uh, CDH4 now has Apache high availability. Um, there's uh, extensibility within the platform. Coprocessors within HBase act like triggers for real-time events. So you can build much richer real-time applications. Those are some of the interesting things we're seeing on the platform. So I got I to ask you the Hortonworks question because you guys to me are like cousins. You both have kind of grown up in the Hadoop community. You guys were the first commercial venture-backed company. Um, those guys spun out of Yahoo. Again, got heavily backed by Benchmark. You guys are backed by Excel. So in a way, you're kind of the cousins. And then you have other guys, MapR, you got EMC, Greenplum doing some stuff in a variety of other proprietary or kind of old school legacy vendors in BI and data warehousing. So how do you how do you tell the folks how to make sense of those worlds? Um, this is not so much a Cloudera versus Hortonworks, because what's the difference between you guys and then what's the difference between you guys and the other guys? Yeah, well I think there's, um, there's a community that builds this open source software and certainly, uh, obviously Hortonworks participates, Yahoo participates heavily still uh, with their engineering team, Facebook participates, Twitter does. A a lot of the web companies do. And in fact, a lot of our customers on the commercial side, uh, non-web properties, are starting to contribute as well. Clutter Invest, as I said, a lot of our time uh, contributing and building the capabilities of the open source ecosystem. The question is, once it's out in open source, what happens next? So there's uh, over a dozen different projects that make up the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. 
all told, there's over 50 different releases from every single branch, from every single project every year. And it's very hard for someone in uh, an average company to actually track. They just want to consume software that solves their problem that's tightly integrated. And so I think we have different philosophies as to how to approach that. So talk about um, HBase. HBase becomes part of, the, as I said in theCUBE, the holy trinity of Hadoop. You got HDFS, you got MapReduce, and you got HBase. Um, a lot of people have been criticizing HBase, saying you know it's a tailored suit, one use case, not very scalable, hard to work with. Mongo's been saying a lot of things over here. What's the true and false statements that have been kicked around around HBase, and, and, and what are people missing about HBase? How relevant is it in your mind? Uh, HBase actually is pretty critical. I mean, it's modeled on what Google created when they created Bigtable. Today, Bigtable powers a lot of their applications and infrastructure. And we're seeing HBase power the equivalent things out in the real world or outside of Google, right? I guess Google's the real world too. Yeah, yeah. Outside of Google. Um, but uh, Facebook, for example, famously chose uh, HBase to actually power their messages every time you message on Facebook. That's an HBase uh, application. If you get point of interest data that is not driven by Google, it's driven by anywhere else, it actually comes from Nokia. They have a unit called Navtech that collects all that data, refines it in Hadoop, and publishes it using HBase. So I think HBase touches a lot more people in a lot more ways than they actually realize. It's just in the back office, it's underpinning. What is it good for? HBase is really great for any time you need real-time atomic access to data. If you can tie a session or a user ID or or a user profile to a lot of variable data. It might be a catalog, it might be a shopping cart, it might be a user session, and then bring all that together and continuously update and analyze it in real time as you're interacting with the user. And that's different from what other approaches and wh why is it better? Uh, well, there are other approaches that uh, are more classic relational. HBase is not a relational database. I don't think it was ever designed to be. If you need relational database technology, you use a relational database. Uh, and there's other solutions that are more focused on storing documents or collections and indexing them in relation to the rest of the data. I think HBase is a lot more focused on discrete access. Final question, and we'll let you go, and great great content here with Omar um, from Cloudera on the cutting edge of big data and uh, enterprise. Tell the folks out there what's happening here at Intel at this developer forum. What's your impression and what's the vibe here? Uh, here it's actually a lot, very energetic, very exciting, and very diverse. I think I've been very impressed in seeing, uh, as we talked about mobility, as well as things that are deep within the bowels of the data center, as well as real application and solution focus. What do the different components that Intel manufactures come together to actually solve for real people? Again, Intel, like HBase, touches a lot of people in many different ways that you don't really realize. And now I think Intel is very focused on being able to tell that story and communicate what you use Intel for. Okay, Omar, thanks a lot. This is uh, John Furrier with SiliconAngle.tv and SiliconAngle.com reporting here at uh, Intel Developer Forum 2012 here in Moscone in San Francisco, California. Right back with our next guest.